being at the amusement park, watching your grandfather work, can you talk about how that shaped your business background and then share some of the early lessons you learned? If you think about it this way, at an amusement park, you have an amusement, right? You have either it's a ride or it's entertainment. And around that you have some sort of, all, you have three different profit centers generally. You have merchandise, games of chance, food. And so early on, I learned this concept of what you know people call transmedia. I call it a sin experience. And I'll tell you why in a second. But like I learned, like this has always been in my DNA, like how to create, like basically how to build out story worlds. Um, and so um, you know, if you go to an amusement park and they do it well, they'll create different sorts of experiences throughout the park. You know, like for instance, you go to Disney World, you have like, you know, Frontierland, um, you know, you'll have like different sorts of things in it. But if you're in Frontierland, you're gonna eat barbecue, everybody's dressed in Western gear, and it looks that way. So I started to develop my, my um, film properties pretty much the same way, that I was gonna build out a story world, just not a linear storyline, where people could be entertained with different facets of the, of the, uh, of the content. Uh, so people can jump in and jump out of the storyline and everything else. Um, but it was interesting though, is um, as a kid, I started to realize certain business things um, where I was outside of an office one day and I heard my two uncles debating about who was gonna get the syrup contract between Coke and Pepsi. And so I'm like, hmm, that's interesting because they're exactly the same price, right? It all came down to how much free stuff that we were gonna get. And so, and that's literally what the deciding factor was, is how much free merch they were gonna get. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And so from day one of my filmmaking career, I've always had product placement in all my films. And it's been something that it's, one is I feel like it uh, makes this story that much more authentic because you're using real product. But then number two is you get a bunch of free stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and then with Billboard, we ended up even, them even giving us money for things too. So living in an, you know, living, you know, as a family that had an amusement park, it gave me a completely different sensibility than a lot of my peers have. What did watching your grandfather's business teach you about sponsorship? Um, okay, it's, it, it's interesting because my grandfather um, helped build it, but then it was his, his brothers and sisters that ran it. Uh, so it was interesting because my grandfather was pushed out of his will because my grandfather wanted to raise his kids instead of being raised in the park. So he was completely ostracized from the park. Um, early on. Aww. So we had to work it and everything because it was a family tradition, uh, but my grandfather never got any of the riches from it whatsoever. He got, when his, when his father passed away, he got 500 bucks. And hmm. you know, that's, that's the way it is, that's what it was. So I just wanted to make sure that you realize it was my grandfather, it was actually sure. my uncles and aunts that were running it. Okay. Um, but um, uh, it, it taught me a lot. It taught me a matter of one is taking care of people is very important. Uh, realizing that you know it is a business, even though we're in show, uh, it makes you realize that you know all the hard work that goes into it. You know the park opens at you know twelve o'clock. We're there at eight. The park closes at uh, you know at ten o'clock. We're there till two. You know, so it's just a matter of like so long hours. <laughs> we're par for the course. Um, but it's also interesting too is like how much ingenuity took place. Uh, and also it's a matter of, um, like my great grandfather ended up having a bunch of patents on, on, um, on uh, different sorts of concession things, uh, and which is kind of interesting. Um, and, um, but also too, is like you had to change with the times. And it's interesting because in the film industry, people are so afraid to change where, and I'm a very early adopter of a lot of stuff. That's why I've always been. Uh, and in the entertainment or in the amusement business, you have to be the same way. You have to constantly be fresh. You have to be new. You can't be boring or else people are going to come year after year. You can't have the same old rides. You have to do something different, you know, new spectacles. When you saw that he put in all this hard work and then in the end, maybe it didn't turn out exactly the way he had planned or, or maybe it wasn't that important to him. Did it teach you a lot about putting sort of all your energy and hope into something and maybe it'll work out and maybe it wouldn't and being still able to take that risk, kind of being free of like whatever the outcome is? Um, we were are born risk takers. We're also um, we work very hard, and we will persevere. Like it's almost like there's a line of stubbornness <laughs> that you'll keep working and reworking and, and and doing whatever you can to make it work. Um, and you know sometimes you have to pivot uh, in a different direction to make it work. Um, but it's just a matter of if you are honest, you work hard, um, and you have a vision you basically do whatever you can to make that, that vision happen. 
Like my grandfather, um, because he was ostracized from his own family, started a kiddie land at an airport, you know, the Allentown Airport. And it was interesting because people still talk about it. And my grandfather literally built all the rides himself. Uh, he built all the concession stands himself. And it was open from May until September. And my mom and all of her sisters had to work it and things. So it's kind of interesting, like it's in our blood, it's in our DNA to kind of like do this sort of thing and to persevere and to do what you had to do to, to make it. Um, but it was a matter of like, you know, like he was, you know, kind of like shunned from his own family, which is pretty sad. So. I think we already talked about this, but I'll just, more. okay. How many revenue streams does an amusement park have? Gosh, uh, well, you have, first of all, you have admission, right? And then you, know, you generally will have um, your amusement, whether it be a ride or an entertainment. Like, let's say it's like a, like a song and dance routine or something like that. Uh, but then you have merchandise, you have your games of chance, and you have food. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is, is um, Dorney Park was founded as, um, it was a catering company first. Uh, my family moved over here from France in the 1800s, they were all butchers. And to sell more food, they brought in a carousel, <laughs> and that's how the whole park started. Was literally started out as, as as a food operation, and to sell more food, they built amusements. And my great grandfather came very friendly with Walt Disney because uh, their boats were right next door to each other in Fort Lauderdale in Florida. And um, and when when Disney was building, you know, Disney World in Orlando, um, it was um, it was interesting because you know Disney had a completely different view on what he was doing versus what my grandfather was doing. Disney was a dreamer. My grandfather was a money maker, uh, and and his his sole purpose was really to entertain. But as you entertain people, people forget about what they're spending and they spend more money. Oh, that's a great point. You know, and it's kind of it's 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 like one of those things. And and so um, I'm not saying that every amusement park is built the way that my grandfather my great grandfather built his, but that's that that was like literally the DNA of it. So it wasn't originally supposed to be an amusement park. It was to sell more food. So the food was unbelievable. And so then you also understand why he had all these patents on concessions, like, you know, with like ketchup and mustard dispensers that would like basically turn and, and the condiment would flow out. He actually patented the um, waffle iron that flips. Uh, all these weird things just to be able to sell more, more food. So when it comes to filmmaking, which would you say you are? The Walt Disney model or your grandfather's? Ooh. Wow, um, <laughs> I'd say both because it's funny because I write, direct, and produce. Uh, I will produce other people's work, but I'll, I will direct what I write um, and end up producing it as well. Um, but um, I am a dreamer as a Disney and I do create everything from scratch. Um, but at the same time, I'm very practical. Like for instance, with Billboard, we ended up driving revenue very early on to the project, we were cash flow positive before we ever shot any film uh, because we ended up selling billboard spaces throughout the content. Uh, and so, I mean, mind you, it cost a lot more than just the billboard spaces. You know, like we, you have, I have a bunch of money wrapped up in it. But so I'm a pragmatist and also a dreamer at the same time. Uh, I think that's what's made me somewhat successful is because I can think both ways. Um, and but at the same time, if I know that I have to make that dream happen, I will work my butt off to make it happen. That makes sense. So, 